evening, everybody. Let's find a way to start this new talk. Let me say that it's, it's a real pleasure hosting here His Excellency Mohammed Javad Zarif, who's the Foreign Minister of Islamic Republic of Iran. Thanks for being here again, I must say, with us. And thanks to Nicolas Pelham from The Economist, who's talk with the minister with me. So uh, let's, uh, let's start this uh, talk, this discussion, from the title of MED, Beyond Turmoil, a Positive Agenda, Turmoil, the Region. So give us a sense, Mr. Minister, of uh, the situation in the region at this time, and how do you see that? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Very good afternoon to all of you, and I start by saying what we Muslims say all the time because it's a good reminder that the God that somebody, some people kill in the name of, uh, we call the compassionate and the merciful every day to remind ourselves that this is the God we are dealing with. Um, the situation in, the, in our region, and I'm modest enough to focus on the Persian Gulf, why the Persian Gulf maybe, uh, so that we do not add complications. It's because some continue to see the situation in terms of zero sum. They continue to try to find their interest at the expense of the interest of others. And they continue to make the wrong choices. Now, I want to take you back a few decades. They supported Saddam Hussein against Iran, trying to exclude Iran from the region. Then they supported the Taliban. Then they supported ISIS and Nusra and others. And look where we are now. We believe that in this region, all of us need to live together. The threats, and, and since you want to look forward rather than backward, the threats that we face are not a threat against Iran, threats against Saudi Arabia or Syria or Iraq. They're threats against all of us. Now, we can look at the sources of these threats, the domestic sources for the threats, lack of participation, lack of hope, the external sources for the threat, primarily because some of us in the region look for security from outside, try to purchase security rather than to achieve security within. But whatever these threats are, they threaten all of us at the same time. And we need to find a formula to work together. In Iran, we have proposed a regional dialogue forum. We want to focus on our immediate region, the Persian Gulf, which has been the source of many wars in the last uh, two, three decades, four decades to include the Iran-Iraq war, and to see whether we can change that uh, dynamics into one of discussion dialogue to prevent situations like the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, like uh, the situation between Saudi Arabia and Qatar, and like the differences between Iran and Saudi Arabia. You use uh, several times a day, and I like to speculate about this day, but for sure there is a big question mark hanging on the future of Iran, which is connected to the nuclear deal. It has been an accomplishment, a very important one, but now it's obviously under threat. How do you see the future in this sense? And do you think that uh, the allies, those who helped signing this nuclear deal, will keep their decisions or you see fractions and divisions out there? Well, to respond to the second part of your question, we don't see fractions and divisions uh, within the people who negotiated the nuclear deal with the exception of a newcomer. Uh, that was not a part of the negotiations and believes uh, otherwise. But there is a, again, going back to the same fundamental conceptual framework that I discussed in, the, in answering your previous question. The nuclear deal was achieved when all of us understood that we could not have everything we wanted. 
I can tell you for sure that this deal is not what I want. And I can tell you for sure that this deal is not what John Kerry wanted, nor is it what other participants in the negotiations wanted. And that's the beauty of the deal, because it's not what we wanted. It's what we could achieve. Now, people who were not engaged in the negotiations believe that by some miraculous design, they can come in and do something much better. We have people like that at home, and I believe the new administration in Washington is of the same view, that had they negotiated, they would have achieved something far better for the United States. I can assure you that this is the best deal that could be achieved, could have been achieved in the past, can be achieved in the future. And once we all realize that international relations is about finding a balance between give and take, then we would reach the conclusion that we need to find some sort of a working mechanism. We, I mean, the United States, in the early 2000s, went for a zero enrichment option. And some of the people who are currently advising President Trump, officially or unofficially, were directly involved. And they prevented any deal. At that time, a nuclear deal with Iran, at that time Iran had less than 200 centrifuges. A nuclear deal with Iran would have been possible with somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,000 nuclear centrifuges. But the United States went for 100%, for zero enrichment. The result was, in 2013, when we started negotiating again, Iran had 20,000 centrifuges. Of course, we had suffered too. We went from a positive 7% growth to a negative 7% decline. So if people try to achieve a zero-sum option, they will end up losing. It's not that one side will win, the other side will lose. It's only the difference in the, in the amount of loss. So when we realize that, after many years of doing the wrong thing, everybody realized that we needed to reach some balance between give and take, and that's what the JCPOA is. It's a balance. It's not what we want. It's not what the Americans want. It's not what the Europeans want but it's what we could achieve. And I think the sooner the current administration in Washington realizes that, the sooner we can get over this and get engaged in more serious problems that, that are affecting our region. Professor Zari, thank you. Uh, as you said, we have a new administration in, in Washington. We have the dramatic announcement of a new Secretary of State in Washington as well, Rex Tillerson has gone. What sort of impact do you think that's going to have on any prospect of, for the nuclear deal? What impact do you think it's going to have on the region? And couldn't Iran really do something a lot more to address the threat perception that there is in the West of its actions in the region by doing something to rein in the, the armed groups that it sponsors? Iran is not alone in, in, in the region in sponsoring armed groups, but it's doing nothing to um, to, to, for, for, for state stability. Couldn't you help a process of conflict diffusion with disarmament, encouraging disarmament, demobilization, integration of Hezbollah, the Houthis, other armed groups um, into mili state militaries? Well, uh, I do not make a practice of interfering in the internal affairs of other countries, so we let the Americans decide what they want and who they want as their, their Secretary of State. Uh, we have problems with the policies that are coming from Washington, and I believe those policies are extremely dangerous. Impulsive, uh, not based on, not grounded in reality, whether be it the nuclear deal or the situation in the region. You remember the tweets about Qatar a few hours after the situation. So generally, uh, I think a revision of, uh, or a reorientation, or a cognitive 
adjustment to our region is certainly highly necessary in, in Washington. As far as the situation in the region, you see, people have made the wrong choices and they accuse Iran of the consequences. I mean, it wasn't Iran that supported Saddam Hussein. For eight years, they gave Saddam Hussein everything, billions upon billions of dollars worth of support, military, financial, whatever you wanted. Even the United States came to the Persian Gulf with its uh, fleet to support so-called freedom of navigation. In the meantime, shooting down a civilian airliner with 290 passengers on board. So all of this was done what? To support the savior, Saddam Hussein. And a year later, Saddam Hussein turned his gun against those who had given it to him. And where were we? I mean, it's important to remind yourselves of realities of the past. We came to the support of the Kuwaitis. We didn't say you deserve it. You supported him eight years when he was using chemical weapons against our people. We supported the Kuwaitis. Then they supported the Taliban. Don't read this nonsense that CIA is trying to feed into uh, the foundation for the defense of democracies or whatever they want to call themselves about Iran's relations. Who recognized the Taliban as the official government of Afghanistan? Just look at the history. I'm not, I'm not giving you gimmicks. It was Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Pakistan. Okay, Pakistan was a neighbor. But where did Saudi Arabia and the UAE come supporting the Taliban? Then look at ISIS. Don't quote me, quote either Secretary Clinton or the former Prime Minister of Qatar, who supported ISIS and Nusra in Syria, hoping that they would overturn, overthrow the government of Syria within three weeks. And look that six years down the road where we are. Who was behind this entire blockade of Qatar? Who tried to force the Prime Minister of Lebanon out of office? Was it Iran? So if we are talking about all of this, let's be serious. Now let's talk about missiles. Iran has missiles. But are we the only ones in the region who have missiles? We have missiles that we build because nobody else gives them to us. But Saudi Arabia has missiles that it received from China with the range of 2,500 kilometers. Ours has a range of 2,000 kilometers. And in addition to that, they spent $86 billion last year buying what President Trump called beautiful military equipment. We spent $16 billion. And the size of our armed forces is many times this. So if you want to look at the source of instability in the region, you need to look at the cognitive disorder in our region, that people believe that they can buy security from outside, rather than engaging their neighbors in order to gain security from within. Mr. Zarif, sir. I didn't make an opening remark because I knew I would yeah, be wrong with that in response. Yeah, I sooner or later, <laughs> perfect. But uh, in any case, you were talking about support. It's a fact that you are supporting countries and people even through uh, arms and uh, activities on the ground, right? Who? You, who, as Iran. Who are who? we supporting? Uh, Iraq, for instance. Well, how did we support Iraq? When the ISIS was about three hours from taking over Erbil, yeah, yeah, but I'm not judging. Mr. Barzani just... called us. No, no, no. The head of the Kurdish regional government called us and asked us for help. And we went there to help them. And he's not a Shia. So the nonsense about Shia Crescent, I mean, is Barzani a Shia? Is the Emir of Qatar a Shia? Is the president of Turkey a Shia? Is the president, former president of Afghanistan a Shia? We went to their help, each single one of them. We went to the help of President Rabbani when Taliban took over. We went to the help of President Barzani when, Talib when ISIS wanted to take over. We went to the help of President Erdogan when there was a coup. We went to the help of uh, Emir of Qatar when uh, the Saudis tried to suffocate them. So that's how we, uh, we behave. This is exactly my starting point. I said, you're supporting 
people you're supporting. Good countries. people. And so, my question, yeah, good people. It's your judgment, I'm fine with that. But my question was, how long it will last? So my question was a projection of it. Are you planning to stay there permanently? Is it something different, of a totally different style? Meaning you help them and now you're going back home? You see, we are in this region. Nobody is going home. We are in the region. We didn't come. I mean, that's why we insist on calling this place Persian Gulf. It's not the Gulf of Mexico. We, we are there. This, this, this is, I mean, I mean we, we all know history, and we all know who changed, who's trying to change history. It's, we're there. It's our home. We're not trying to exclude any regional player from this home. We're not trying to exclude Saudi Arabia. We're not trying to exclude the United Arab Emirates. We're not trying to exclude Egypt or Syria. We believe that all these countries need to live together, to work together, to, uh, to work for peace. And, but they, some people are trying, I mean, their entire focus is symbolizing the question that you ask, when are you leaving? Never. We cannot, we cannot leave our home. This is our home. We're not asking anybody to leave. And we're not leaving. But can we help each other to secure this place? Of course we can. It is in our interest. It is in everybody's interest to work together in order to secure this place. When others, your foes in the region, uh, look at Iran, they see Iran, Iran's presence in um, uh, very strong influence in many in many Arab capitals um, across the region. If you want to help the region, wouldn't one way in which you do that be to could do that be to? Uh, it's the same question that I asked before, really, but I don't think you you answered it. Couldn't you find a way of integrating the armed groups that you now support into the state structures, support a process of demobilization, of disarmament, of the Houthis, of Hezbollah, of other armed groups, and build up the state structures and thereby try and restore the, region, the stability in the region? Well, these are decisions that those countries need to make. What we have suggested, for instance, for Yemen is, you know, two weeks after the campaign of bombardment of Yemen started, Iran proposed a four-point four peace plan, immediate ceasefire, urgent humanitarian assistance, intra-Yemeni dialogue, and an inclusive Yemeni government, which would include everybody, and certainly the Houthis would not have control over that government. They would be a part of it, but they would not have control. But people are not interested in anything less than 100%. And by people, I, I do not want to make this, turn this into a Saudi bashing argument, but Saudi Arabia has rejected every, every single ceasefire effort in Syria, every single ceasefire effort in Yemen. We have tried our four-point plan for ceasefire in Syria was presented two months after I assumed office. That's in 2013, September 2013. It's been on the, I mean, it's been around. But people believe in a military solution. And they pick the wrong side if they wanted the military solution. I mean, there is and we, 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 shouldn't be, we shouldn't be responsible for their, as I said, we shouldn't be responsible for their wrong choices. The, the, there are now attempts at creating ceasefires across, across Syria. You have um, an American-Russian agreement since July, no, which no, relates no, before, to- Before with, the American-Russian agreement, just, you had sorry, the Astana process, but, which we initiated. Right, but just on the American-Russian agreement. No, why do we need to stand on the American-Russian agreement? We have an Astana process, which Iran, Turkey, and Russia started long before the American-Russian agreement, and that is holding. And it's been holding for 11 months. They, they, they had an agreement to withdraw Iranian-backed fighters from uh, southwestern Syria. Will Iran comply with that? You see, United States and Russia cannot decide for Iran. We are there on the request of the Syrian government, and we will act 
based on that request, but we haven't been asked by Russia to do anything. Whether we have a presence there or not, I do not know, but we haven't been asked by Russia to do anything in that area. So please do not try to complicate the issue. There is an Astana process. Complicated enough. Huh? It's complicated enough. There is an Astana process. The Astana process has been holding. We have less bloodshed in Syria for the past 11 months. And I do not know why people are not, I mean, why people are reluctant to even give credit to this process that has been working for 11 months. Why is it? Why does any solution of the problem in Syria has to involve the United States? I mean, l l listen to what President Trump said about their own role in, in Syria when he was campaigning. Why does it have to, have to involve the United States? Why can't you accept that a, an arrangement by regional countries in Syria has been holding for 11 months, longer than any ceasefire negotiated by the West in Syria? And let's, why don't we all try to join a successful process? It's not closed door, it's open-ended. You're saying you'd welcome America's yeah. inclusion in a, in a process of conflict. We never rejected anybody's inclusion in the process. They decided to stay out of it. Because the aim of the current administration in Washington is to remove Iran from Syria. That's the aim, and that's where they fail. Because we are in the region. I mean, if anybody can be removed from the region, it's people who are out, coming from outside the region without invitation. Can we, Mr. Minister, can we go back to economy for a second? Because uh, one, aspect, one aspect of the nuclear deal is uh, the chance to reestablish a strong and good economy in Iran. So these threats on the nuclear deal could uh, create a problem in terms of investment, in terms of uh, future development for Iran. Do you think the investors could be really scared about the pr perspectives of the nuclear deal? Well, this is the intention of the Trump administration, unfortunately. Uh, since the beginning of the Trump administration, they have tried to scare the investors from coming to Iran. Thankfully, uh, people have been coming. We have had good interaction with Europeans, with the Japanese, with Koreans, with the Chinese, uh, and many others are coming to invest in Iran because Iran is a safe investment environment. You see, the difference, and I, I'm not interested in, in uh, bashing others because they do enough of that but Iran. But in Iran, for the past 37, 38 years, we have been under external pressure. External economic pressure, external military pressure, eight years of war, external sanctions. And we have been able to become stronger, to become more influential in the region, to advance in many areas of science and technology because we rely on our own people. That makes our economy appealing to foreign investors because it's the safest, most, most secure investment opportunity in the region. Of course, we have difficulties. Of course, we have been outside international economic relations for many years because of the sanctions. But now that the sanctions are removed, many European and Asian firms see Iran as a good investment opportunity, and in spite of all the arm twisting by the United States, and it used to be uh, secret arm twisting during the previous administration, open arm twisting during this administration. The arm twisting has been taking place throughout. In spite of the arm twisting, more and more European companies are coming in, and I believe it, it is in the interest of security and stability in the region if we get more, because Iran will, would need to derive benefits from the nuclear deal. We have done our part. You see, the nuclear deal was focused on a specific issue, 
the nuclear issue. It doesn't mean that we were afraid to deal with other issues. As you saw me, I can present our case with regard to the regional issues and with regard to the missile issue. And we have a lot to say. We have a lot to ask. Believe me, if there is a deal on those issues, it will not be one-sided, as the nuclear deal was not one-sided. But we decided, we made a conscious decision to focus on the nuclear issue. We made a conscious decision not to include missiles or regional issues, because it would have made it too complicated to resolve. Now people are telling us that in order to, while we have done what we were supposed to do in the nuclear issue, that in order to draw the benefits of the nuclear deal, we need to do other things. That makes the partners in the deal unreliable. Because nobody will deal with those who would get what they want and then ask for more. As the Americans say, what mine, what's mine is mine and what's yours is negotiable. Mm -hmm. In the nuclear deal, everybody has pocketed what Iran has provided. And now they're asking for more in order for Iran to get what its side of the bargain was. And believe me, not only Iran will never do that, but it's sending the wrong signal to others that this type of deal making is not sustainable. If, if you don't get the investment that you're looking for, what impact do you think that's going to have on the distribution of power inside, inside Iran? It was very clear from the May elections that President Rouhani had the support of the population, but it seems increasingly that the decision making is not in his hands, it's in the hands of others who have not been elected. Would you expect them to gain more power as a result of a failure to deliver economically on the nuclear deal? Well, I think the same arguments were being made when we had the elections. And those arguments turned out not to be the case. I think the United States pressure has, in fact, created more solidarity inside Iran. I can judge by myself. I'm being much less attacked today than I was before President Trump came to office, and I thank him for that. <laughs> so you, you basically, you basically stole, my stole my question because I read a piece in the New York Times a couple of days ago, and it was quoting that uh, uh, in this moment for public opinion, you know that we Europeans are kind of obsessed with public opinion. And so they were saying that public opinion in Iran now has two stars. One is General Soleimani, and the second one appears to be you. So I wanted to ask you if it's your merit or if you owe the favor to President Trump and to the Saudis. So basically, this is the question. But let's stay on public opinion for a second, because uh, I remember that in the last decade, there were so many pressures, even from outside, saying public opinion sooner or later will uh, revolt to the system. Where do you see today public opinion in Iran? Well, public opinion uh, is not a constant. It evolves and it changes. And uh, our public reacts strongly to external pressure. You quoted New York Times. I told New York Times some 12, 13 years ago that we are allergic to pressure. If people decide to impose pressure on Iran, the public will react strongly. And I, I believe it is good that in Iran we do not have a monolith. We have an active public opinion. People can vent out their frustrations, not by wearing a suicide vest, but at the ballot box. And they do that every two, three years because our parliamentary elections and our presidential election don't happen to be at the same time. So people can get a chance to vote. And that is what has preserved our security and stability. People should not look to outsiders to gain stability. People have to look within. And that's how we gain stability. We live in a very difficult environment. We live under constant pressure from outside, constant. As I gave you examples from 37, 38 years ago, has been nonstop. But we have survived. 
Now, people in Europe like to criticize us on democracy. Of course, you have very good allies, very democratic in our region. But, <laughs> but, but you like to criticize us on democracy. But have you asked this question, how can this government survive in spite of all the pressure from outside? How can this government prosper in spite of all the pressure and sanctions from outside? Had we not had the support of our own people, how could we survive? People started asking that question from themselves. One minute, yeah. I th ahead, yeah. yeah. One minute to go. I mean, I, uh, consistently, I think you've had American administrations that have asked to have official meetings with, you know, presidents who've asked for meetings with um, the presidents of Iran, and it hasn't happened. What will it take? to get a meeting between the President of well, the United States and the President of Iran. Well, I think John Kerry and I Iran. compensated for that 37 years. We had more meetings than anybody else, but if we cannot show that those meetings produce results that can be sustainable, then what there is to have more meetings? You see, Secretary Kerry and I had about two years of constant meetings, and we achieved something. So we cannot say Iran and the United States never met. We did meet. And it resulted in an achievement. Now somebody is trying to torpedo that achievement and ask for a meeting with our president. That's contradiction in terms. You need to show respect before you ask for a meeting. Meetings, international relations, should be based on mutual respect, on equal footing, and mutual respect. And once any US administration is ready to exercise that, then it would be a different situation. Minister Zarif, thank you. Really thank you. thank you. I think you all join me in thanking Minister Zarif for this open and light discussion. Thank, thank you. Thank you.